In this video, we will be looking at the step and frequency response of an RC circuit, also called a low pass filter, where we have a single resistor and a single capacitor. The step response is when you drive the circuit with a square wave to the input, and then you look at the output as the voltage rises and falls. And the frequency response is as you drive the input to the circuit with a sine wave and look at the resulting output sine wave as you change the frequency of this input sine wave. Now, if you are just joining us, this video is part of a companion series to my intro circuit theory playlist where we go over all of the math for these circuits. So if you need to see the math and equations for the step response of an RC circuit, or the frequency response of an RC circuit, go check out the corresponding videos. I will link this playlist in the description of this video. In this series, rather than doing the math, I am going to show you how to build the circuits in an online circuit simulator called Tinkercad Circuits. It lets you build and simulate a circuit using a virtual breadboard as well as virtual tools like a function generator and oscilloscope. So if you want to practice before using a real breadboard to make sure you get everything right and don't damage anything, or if you are doing online learning and, for example, teaching or attending office hours over Zoom, it is much easier to screen share and show Tinkercad than it is to hold a physical breadboard up to a webcam. So even if you're using a physical breadboard, a simulation isn't really a complete replacement for that. It can be good for that virtual learning environment. So now I'm going to delete everything I have here and we are going to start from scratch to show you how to build and analyze this circuit. So I'm going to start with my breadboard and on the breadboard, I'm going to connect a resistor and a capacitor in series. So as I point out in each of these videos, the nice thing about Tinkercad is that when you mouse over one of the breadboard holes, it highlights the other connected holes in green. So you can see how everything on the breadboard is connected and the most common mistake I see students make when I ask them to connect two components in series is they do this and then build everything and wonder why their circuit is not working. And as you can see, when I mouse over rows eight and nine in Tinkercad here, row eight on the breadboard is not electrically connected to row nine. So even though it looks like these two parts are physically or geometrically in series, they are not electrically connected, they are not electrically in series. To connect them electrically in series, I have two simple options here. One is to just move the capacitor up or the resistor down, so their two terminals are joined in the same row here. I could also bridge that gap with a short jumper wire, which I can add just by clicking in Tinkercad, and now they are electrically connected. And as I also emphasize in most of these videos, it is important not to get geometrically in series or parallel mixed up with electrically series or parallel. I could, for example, make a 90 degree bend here and connect the capacitor like that. And even though they are not physically in series anymore, they are still electrically in series since this terminal of the capacitor is connected to this terminal of the resistor. I think that way looks a little messier. So I am gonna stick with doing this and I'll bridge with a jumper wire there. So my resistor and my capacitor are in series. I have not mentioned the resistor or capacitor value yet. In Tinkercad, you can sort of cheat and just click on them and change the value. So I could change this from one kilo ohm to 10 kilo ohms, for example, just by typing a 10 in there instead. Same thing for the capacitor. The default value here is 100 nanofarads. Maybe I'll change that to a microfarad for demonstration purposes here. So reading resistor color codes, as well as reading the text on a capacitor, which is not displayed in Tinkercad, is really a topic for another video. Again, in Tinkercad, we can sort of cheat here. And the other thing to watch out for if you are doing this in a physical lab is that some capacitors are polarized. So the capacitors in Tinkercad are not. I could mirror this part. It actually doesn't let me mirror the capacitor, but I could flip it around, rotate it 180 degrees, and this would work the same way. Some capacitors in the real world are polarized, so watch out for what you're doing depending on how or what you have available if you're doing this in a physical lab. So. We have our resistor and our capacitor in series for our RC circuit. The next thing we need to do is add a function generator in Tinkercad. So I'm gonna go ahead and search for that. And I am going to connect the output or positive terminal of the function generator to the end terminal of my resistor as the input to the circuit. And again, go check out the companion video introducing RC circuits if you wanna see the circuit diagram equivalent of this with the input and output recommended, sorry, input and output marked. 
And since there are only two components here, this is one of the rare circuits where I am not going to bother using the ground buses. I'm just going to connect directly to the components in my circuit, but for more complicated circuits with more than just two things, as explained in some of the other videos, you're going to want to make good use of your power and ground buses. Now I will want to hook up an oscilloscope so I can measure both the input and output voltages to the circuit. And the oscilloscope in Tinkercad is pretty limited. You can only show one channel at a time. So you're actually going to need to add two of these, one to show the input voltage and one to show the output voltage. So I am going to connect the negative or ground wire from each oscilloscope to this same row here that I have the capacitor in. And let's see if Tinkercad will let me, actually won't let me connect to that hole behind the capacitor. This is one of the downsides of using Tinkercad, that kind of the 3D parts can obscure some of the holes that would be available on a physical breadboard. But it does let you do something that you can't really do on a physical breadboard, and that's connect two wires to one hole. So I'm just treating this row like my ground bus and have all my negative wires connected there. I'm gonna treat my first scope up here like channel one. I'm gonna use that to measure the input voltage directly from the function generator, connecting there. And I'm going to use my second scope as channel two to measure the output voltage from the circuit, which is the terminal where the resistor is connected to the capacitors. The way I have both rows eight and nine here connected with that jumper wire, I can connect this oscilloscope probe to either of those rows and that is going to measure the output voltage from the circuit. I can then hit start simulation and I can adjust the parameters of the function generator. So if I zoom in here, you see I can set the frequency, the amplitude and the DC offset. So this is a five volt peak to peak wave that is gonna go from zero to five volts because it's offset by 2.5 volts at one kilohertz. And I can change between a square wave, a sine wave and a triangle wave, but you can see that the oscilloscope is not really auto ranging at all. So you need to change the view window by clicking on the X axis here. And then you see, you're just clicking actually anywhere on the oscilloscope and it will then give you an option to change the time division. So time per division right now, the default, the entire window, 10 of these squares is one second and each square is 100 milliseconds. I can drop that down, for example, to 10 milliseconds or one millisecond. And we see that now I can see my one kilohertz square wave. So initially I was zoomed out way too far and the scope wasn't properly picking up that signal. I'm actually gonna maybe drop that down a little more, maybe do half a millisecond and see if I can get just a few, or maybe if I change to microseconds here, see if it wants to update. I have found that the scope can get a little laggy sometimes. So you can see I changed the time and it's not really happy with me. I'm going to start, stop the simulation, try starting again, and there we go. You see it picked up that 500 microseconds. So if you're trying to change that value and it's freezing on you and not updating, try stopping the simulation and starting it again. So the downside of having two different oscilloscopes is the X axes are not synchronized. If I update this one here, it does not automatically update on the other one. So I'm gonna click on the second one here and also change that to 500 microseconds per division. Again, it is being a little laggy on me. So I'll see if that updates, give it a second. And if it doesn't, there we go. So we can now see that I have the step response of the RC circuit on the output. And again, you'll need to go watch the theory video if you wanna understand the behavior here. This will be a little more evident if I drop this frequency slightly. So I'm gonna decrease the frequency because it wasn't really getting all the way to steady state. And then I'm going to zoom out a little bit on my axes here. Maybe I'll go back up to one millisecond instead of 500 microseconds on both of these. Go back up to one millisecond. There we go. And now we can see, even if I drop the frequency a little bit more, that RC step response where when the input voltage changes, so step response meaning I have an instantaneous change in the input, going in this case from zero volts up to five volts, the output doesn't change instantaneously because the capacitor takes some time to charge up. So it starts out at zero volts and then rises up eventually to five volts and a common exercise in an electronics homework assignment or lab is to 
calculate the time constant of this system, which is the amount of time it takes the voltage to get to 63.2% of the final value. I think I had that right. I always have to Google that number because I can't remember if it's 63.2 or 63.7. So if I got that wrong, go ahead and leave a comment below the video chastising me and correcting me. But you can both measure this value experimentally using an oscilloscope. This is another downside of the rather limited oscilloscope in Tinkercad. There are no automatic or manual cursor tools to measure a point on the screen. So you're left kind of just using the grid here and eyeballing it to find that point that is 63 point something percent of the way from the initial value to the final value. But given the resistor and capacitor values, you can also calculate the expected time constant. And again, that is covered in the corresponding theory video about RC circuit step response. So again, a very common lab is to design an RC circuit, calculate the expected, maybe ideal time constant, assuming the ideal values for the resistor and the capacitor, measure the actual values of the resistor and the capacitor, which are each going to have some tolerance and not be equal to that exact value, predict the time constant based on that, and then measure the actual time constant with an oscilloscope and see how it compares to your theoretical values. So again, the theoretical calculation is covered in the other video, but everything you see here with setting up the resistor, the capacitor, the function generator, and then oscilloscopes to measure the input and output channels is how you would go through the experiment to validate that prediction and measure the actual time constant. Now, once you have set all of this up, it is then pretty easy to switch to measuring the frequency response of this circuit. So rather than looking at the step response where the input is a square wave, you are just switching the input over to a sine wave and treating the circuit like a filter that can let some frequencies pass through and block or attenuate other frequencies. Now, this configuration is a low pass filter meaning it will let low frequencies through. So if we look at the amplitudes of both the input and output waves at a relatively low frequency, you'll see that, and I'm not gonna worry about the exact values here because you see that the Y axis of the oscilloscope actually is auto ranging. So this one dropped down to 10. Well, that one is still at 20, but at low frequencies, let's see if I can get that one back up to 20. Oh, that was a little too low. And now I have to mess with the X axis scaling. So. Point being, at low frequencies, the amplitude of the output is also pretty high, and the output is in phase or lined up with the input. So if I look down on the time axis here, you see the peaks of these waves are lined up. But as I gradually crank the frequency up, we're going to see this change. And again, this is gonna be a little tricky to visualize since the graphs are on different oscilloscopes and the Y axis here, the scaling is getting a little off. And again, this gets kind of laggy and goes a little crazy when you change this too much. But as I increase the frequency, it's going to attenuate or not pass through those higher frequencies. So the amplitude of the output signal is going to drop. So the performance here is going to probably be much better on a real oscilloscope. Again, you can see the Tinkercad does get kind of laggy here. Even if I try to click on the function generator and type in a frequency instead of turning the knob. It took a few seconds to update there. And you can see it is taking a while to update the screens of the oscilloscopes. So doing the frequency response in Tinkercad might not be your best option. Again, if you wanna practice setting up the hardware, and there we go. After five or 10 seconds or so there, it updated. Where you can see now, this is a little more zoomed in. This is only 10 volts per division, not 20 volts per div division. And the amplitude of my output signal has gotten smaller because again, this is a low pass filter. It was letting lower frequencies through and not attenuating the amplitude much. As the frequency gets higher, it drops the amplitude more and the output signal becomes out of phase with the input signal. And again, if you wanna see the math behind all of that, go check out the companion video on low pass filters and frequency response. That's it for this video. If you just came directly to this video from Google or YouTube search, make sure you go check out the rest of the playlist and the videos you missed before this one linked in the description here and subscribe to get updates for future videos that I add to this playlist. Thank you.